One of the coolest fringe benefits of getting to work on the Masters of the Universe toy line, specifically the Masters of the Universe Classics toy line, is I had the chance to create or co-create with very talented artists like Axel here, who just his artwork is amazing, to create original Masters of the Universe characters. Most of them were meant for background fodder. Some of them became hugely beloved by fans. Others actually made it their way into being an action figure and were maybe less beloved by fans. The point being is I was really honored to get to do this. But honestly, the coolest creation I felt I got to help put in the line was King He-Man. Obviously not an original character, it's a variant of a character, and I'm not taking 100% credit here at all for coming up with the concept. But I want to show you how I very passionately worked his way into the line, and why. Because having King He-Man in the line, well, oh, it's a little complicated, to say the least. So let's start at the beginning. Well, actually, no, let's start at the middle. For the Masters of the Universe 30th Anniversary line, we were tasked with making sure the new characters tied up a lot of different Motu continuity. I've heard this bedtime story before. Yes, yes, I know. I've told this story quite a few times on different review videos and videos about Motu classics, but the idea of having characters like making Spectre a time traveler helped connect different areas of lore. And the mini-comics really fleshed that out, and we treated them very much as bridges between different eras. And the idea was to finally get to the next era that had been worked on in the vintage line, which was He-Man and Skeletor's children, Hero, Dare, Hero, and Skeletine, battling. So the first sort of pebble in that story did come with uh, a mini-comic appearance. We needed to get Art for Mighty Spectre for the card back, and in his close-up panel, you can see an image of his boss, King He-Man. Now, this was the first time we had a modern image of this concept, which some fans have embraced with original fan art popping up online of this version, but the concept of Adam becoming King He-Man does go back to the vintage line, and it specifically goes back to where the vintage line was going. And that was really what we tried to do with classics, because we wanted to continue the story. So Hero, son of He-Man, was what was worked on actually two different times in the vintage era. The most common version that people know is the one from the, uh, the, the 90s, where it's an adopted son, but there was a previous version from 1988 where it was his actual biological son. And unfortunately, when I left Mattel and I left this on my desk for the new team, it got swept up by HR, and despite people saying, oh, you must have made a copy or kept it for yourself, but no, I, 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 never, I would never do that. I do not steal from employers. I mean, I'm grateful to be employed by them. I would never take it, or photocopy something without permission. All right, so we can stop with that rumor. Erased from existence. And that's basically it. It has been erased from existence, but I did bring it to Comic-Con, shared it with fans, and incorporated a lot of the ideas from it, and from the other Son of He-Man um, uh, pitch from, from, from the 90s, together to create sort of a version of Dare, version of He-Man's son, that was an amalgam of both. Uh, some of his sub-characters later on in the mini-comics are shown to come right from the 90s pitch. But as far as the 87 pitch, Dare was going to become the hero hero by saying by the power of He-Man, and the idea was it was meant to be kind of like a Batman Beyond. The idea that you had the hero, and now you had the next iteration. But it wasn't just a random iteration, the, the character was being mentored by the previous version. And that was actually very much in the, the 1988 pitch where uh, a live-action older He-Man and Skeletor were going to advise Skeletine and Dare on their adventures. And other characters uh, were going to get a uh, update as well. Eva Lynn was going to be an old witch, even though uh, Skeletine was the son of Shadow Weaver and uh, Skeletor in that one. 
And then we combined the elements from where characters were going in the 2000X series, such as Man-at-Arms becoming a Snake Man permanently. So it really all came together very well, and even new elements like uh, Rob David's creation, Adora becoming Despara, which I'm so glad that a figure was made of her. All of this, all of this was about moving the brand forward. Sure, if you love He-Man vs. Skeletor, there's a countless number, well, I'm sure someone actually has counted them, there's a lot of episodes in a lot of different series of He-Man battling Skeletor. We've seen that. You can see that. It's easily accessible. But we wanted to see something new. We wanted to move the brand forward, but do so the way the original line was going to be moving forward before plans fell apart, which is why we really embraced the hero, son of He-Man, and the concept of Dare and Skeletine becoming the new leads, and characters like He-Man and Fiery Keldor there uh, becoming kind of advisors. All right, so with that background to where the original concept of King He-Man comes from, what's so great about the figure, and uh, why has it remained one of my absolute, if possibly, favorite? He may, he may even rank over Spectre there. So... King He-Man is not King Adam, and this was a big deal. He was still Adam, Adam, you know, of the House Randor, but he went by King He-Man, and there was a lot of pushback from fans saying, well, wait a minute, you know, previous kings like Miro and like Randor were known by their first name. You know, King Randor was King Randor, not King uh, uh, Randor Man or something. So, Battle Armor Randor? I don't know. The reason that King He-Man is King He-Man and not King Adam is because he's embracing the name at which the public knows him as this hero. Yes, they know Prince Adam, but Prince Adam as He-Man was the, the, the lineage of the warriors who carried the Sword of He throughout the generation. And he was the ultimate version because he's the direct descendant of King Greyskull other than, you know, versus the other Guardians, which were just brave warriors. Or warrioresses, maybe. Or... Warrior Eam, Warrior Oat, I don't know. Lots of different pronouns. So dropping him into the mini comic was a first stamp of like, really, really want to get here. Don't think we ever will, but this would be so great. And the fact that it came out as a figure, that's actually brings me to my next point about the design. So the horseman looked at a lot of previous kings, like King Randor and King Grayskull, and they even looked at where the brand was going with Hero, the, the uh, not Dare Hero, I know there's two heroes, it gets confusing, gotta, gotta keep, get a program to know who your kings and heroes are, this hero, the uh, the one we did at San Diego Comic Con in 2009, and was going to be the 87 uh, brand update. So his armor, Randor's armor, lots of different characters were looked at for influence for how they were going to be created, because the horsemen had nothing else to go on, it was totally their creation. And the fans also asked about things like the scar across his face. You know, where did this come from? And really, while there was an idea of, you know, battles that he was going to be in, toys are a visual means of telling a story. They are visual storytelling, like comic books, like movies, like uh, a slide projector. So in visual storytelling, you want to use elements that move the character forward in time without having to say it, and giving him, yes, the Leonidas uh, slash Anakin eye scar was meant to be a visual. That time had passed, that battles had happened, and surprisingly to myself, we got to that battle. I never thought we were going to get this deep in the mini comics. It, it amazes me every time that we did more than three. Heck, that we even did three. So, in mini comic five, right? Yes, five, six... Oh, gosh, yes. No, five. Uh, yes, you get to see uh, Skeletor bashing He-Man in their most powerful forms, and there's the source of the scar. Of course, this didn't come out for a couple years after King He-Man as a toy came out, leading the fans to constantly ask and ask about this, and hey, I was glad we got to do it. We even got to finish up the battle with uh, He-Man giving Skeletor the full Thraka Doom, my favorite comic book uh, sound effect, maybe next to, like, Flarp, but Flarp just doesn't get used, and it wouldn't be appropriate in moments like this. So you go with a thrack of doom, okay? Anyway, yeah, he, he takes away uh, Skeletor's full powers by separating Keldor and Demo Man, and since Demo Man can't, or uh, not Demo Man, but uh, Keldor can't survive without Demo Man healing his mortal injuries from the acid, that was uh, a temporary end to Skeletor. And 
connecting elements. Now He-Man can return from new adventures in outer space. And we had some amazing moments in the final mini-comics of He-Man returning and uh, finally getting that kiss with Tila. Really, it was a continuation of the vintage line, filmation, where the line was going. And I know people have said, well, how come you could do that in classics when something like Revelation couldn't just continue filmation? And, well, the answer is because comic books aren't considered real content by the entertainment industry, or at least by licensing and toy companies and IP holders. They're really considered pamphlets that advertise the brand, which gave us a lot more free reign using mini-comics and character bios to continue a story, to literally continue a story, because comic books just sort of fell outside of that realm of restrictions that have held things like Revelation back. So if we wanted to have Adora taking on the mantle of Despara from the DC Comics and have her show up in Motu Classics with uh, you know demons from the uh, 80s storybooks and capturing King He-Man and bringing back Skeletor, we could have Dare go in, take the power sword, saying, by the power of He-Man, I am hero, which again came right from the vintage material where the brand was going in those pitch books. Of course, there's a whole other side of his story where Hero meets the other hero and gets trained and turns into a wizard warrior, which is also where the original hero is going. Okay, so that all brings us back to the King He-Man toy, and I should also address this mini King He-Man because it's kind of important to the whole story and what was happening. So yes, he's sort of an odd bird, isn't he? King He-Man coming with Clawful when all the other characters were main. Well, originally, the King He-Man Mini was supposed to come with a mini of this Skeletor from the Fall of Eternia line. So, Fall of Eternia wound up being something only shown in the mini-comics, but it was originally envisioned along with, well, you may be familiar with Rob David, this was something I worked on with Rob, where we were going to have like a Shadows of the Empire, everything but a movie. There was going to be a video game and, and a toy line and comic books and... Unfortunately, it didn't move forward, and one of the only things left from it was this King He-Man minifigure, and he was originally going to come with the version of Skeletor, which ironically got used in Revelation. Well, probably not ironically, because Rob David worked on both, both projects, so it's kind of like good ideas finally coming around, and now you can actually buy this mini and put him with King He-Man's mini, and there you have the original pack as envisioned. So, there you go. All right, but King He-Man, besides his, uh, his mini, one of the big reasons I love him is this, his, his sword. And this is where I was able to have a personal sort of uh, drop-off, and I, I didn't get to do that that often in the line. I created Panthor's helmet, or rather, I you know, asked the horseman specifically to make that, Goatman's hammer. Again, you know, I specifically asked the horseman to make a hammer for him because we didn't really have a character with a hammer at the time. So this was another accessory that I specifically asked the horseman to do because we would meet and discuss each figure, uh, usually a year at a time at New York Toy Fair. So I asked them to do the 2000X sword, which of course they invented, they created that design, and bash it up to hell and tape it back together again. The reason was, again, I wanted to use every possible means to find a way to storytell with the line. And if accessories can do that, wow. I, that, to me, is just mind-blowing when you can use an accessory to move a line forward. So the sword, traditionally, held up in the air. You get a magic uh, payoff, depending on what series it is. Turns out I'm into He-Man. Not originally how it was, though. Originally, it was two halves of a sword that when combined would allow one to access Castle Grayskull, enter it, and I made a whole video about this, about why He-Man and Skeletor's original toys combined, but you can go see that video for more of that story. The point being is when the Horsemen created the 2000X sword, they wanted to continue that story as well. So the idea that the sword would separate or combine to become the key to Castle Grayskull or the you know, what could harness the power, if you will, harmonize with the orb. That's why they had two split swords for Skeletor in the 2000X line, because what they represented the two halves of the sword from the vintage line, and the idea was they were moving the brand forward, continuing the storytelling through toys, and 
with Skeletor winding up with both halves of the sword, he now became you know, all powerful. It's actually kind of what happened in Revelation. It's amazing how everything just gets all good ideas just get recycled. So with Skeletor in the possession of both halves of the power sword, Man at Arms had to step up to the plate and he created an electronic version of the sword that could also tie into the power of Grayskull. And it could, of course, do other toyetic things like split in half eventually and shoot lasers and I think it would even feed your cat. I don't know, but it did a lot. And that's why we had Man at Arms come with the original version of the 2000X sword in classics because he has to build this for Adam during a dark time when Skeletor has both sides of the sword, at least according to the the Horseman sort of original storyline, and we wanted to pay homage to that. Again, Classics was about incorporating everything. Everything went in. It was, it was like this potpourri to, to sell the most amount of toys, honestly. What can you say? It's my job. I was My job is to sell toys. So that was sort of the story of the 2000X sword, and having its story continue... The idea is that it's now been through, well, it's been through heck, and it's been patched together again, and that's because this is now King He-Man's battle sword, and the reason is, is because now with, with, well, with their kids around, with Skeletine and Dare, Dare is the new caretaker, caretaker, wow, spoonerism, um, Dare has the power sword. And that all moves the brand forward and uses visual storytelling to do it. And to do that through an accessory, I love it. It just hits all of my toy as storyteller, as collectible, as plaything. Everything comes down to his, his accessory, his sword. And when I first saw that sculpt, when the Horseman sent it, I was like, I just, bl they overdid it. I mean, not overdid it, they outdid themselves. I love the way it's taped up. And I mean, it's just. It's my favorite accessory in the whole line, I'm going to say. So that bumps King He-Man up in my liking a lot.